this is a really crucial moment for the world and a really crucial moment for business, science, and technology organizations such as ours and the global governance system. This is the time we've got to make it right. And I think the kind of initiative that we have here is exactly what we need to do that. Uh, Amanda Deep really made some good, gave some good examples of that already. I'd like to start by saying this, what I think we symbolize here is not just technology. We symbolize here a marriage between the science that develops the new knowledge the technology that converts it into usable, useful, practical ways in which it can change our lives. The governance that we need in order to, which he, uh, he, Amanda Deep also referred to, for any, every achievement that we've had in society, a time has come when the way we set up the laws and the policies to support it, to give it the importance it needs, and to make it more effective in reaching out and serving the lives of people. I think what we really represent here is that marriage. And, and this meeting, also because it's a partnership with the Human Security uh, Trust Fund and the Global Campaign on Human Security for All, it, in, it introduces one other element, and that is people. I don't mean we're all people and all of this work is done by people, but global society. What we need today, we have 140 leaders of nations meeting here this week in the uh, General Assembly on how we're going to tackle the deficit in the SDGs and how we're going to catch up because of the problems of COVID and uh, the U war in Ukraine and the threats of climate change and everything. Uh, but what we don't have fully directly represented are the people of the world, of humanity. And what we think this effort is doing is not just, we're bringing together partnerships between business and science and governance but, and civil society. But we also need to include, we need the whole world on our side for this because this is just too important. We need everybody to understand the significance of climate change, the, the importance of education, the importance of extending health care to everybody and employment opportunities to everybody. And our partnership, it's not just one thing. It, we represent that whole partnership of bringing them all together. And we're reaching out with the human security uh, campaign to parliamentarians, to interfaith and religious groups around the world, to artists, to universities, to youth groups, to NGOs of all description, to business, to financial organizations, because I think that's what then that's what this represents. We believe that the, the SDGs can be achieved. They can be achieved on time, perhaps even overachieved, but we can never do it just with one of these things. We've got to do it by bringing them all together. They're all the 17 SDGs and they're all the seven dimensions of human security and, human, and technology can be a is already, but can be even a much more powerful driver for all seven dimensions of human security, just like I didn't choose my favorite technology because there are so many. I can't choose my favorite dimension either because they're all so important and we can't live without any of them. It's not that we just want food or we want good water. If we don't have clean air and if we don't have safe streets and environments, we don't have security. And the irony today is that in spite of our phenomenal economic and technological development in the world, Actually, right now, the, the, the polls show that people are less secure than we've been probably in the last 50, 70 years. And we've got to ask, why is that? What's missing to give us that sense of safety, that sense of confidence and trust in ourselves? And I think there are a number of reasons for that, but one of them is the technological and social development is just happening so quickly at rates unprecedented in the past that in spite of all our efforts, we're not able to keep up with the pressures with the, to accommodate quickly enough, to respond enough for the next generation. To, we don't know what's coming. We don't even know how to plan for it. And so that poses a real challenge. And I think 
there are many answers to that, but I, to come back to answer your question, I think the most crucial thing that we have to do is we need an educational system that's not just oriented towards the past, to collecting and passing on the knowledge and history of the past, but able to prepare the next generations for what's coming in the future. And for that, technology is absolutely essential, and we're, we're yet to really see, I think we're on the verge of a technology revolution in education. Because today there are hundreds of millions of young people around the world who cannot get, I'm just talking higher education, let alone uh, higher, who cannot get that education. It's not available, it's too costly. It's designed to prepare people for jobs that won't exist anymore. But the technology that you mentioned, the, the chat GDP, the things that are emerging right now, give us the capacity to develop an entirely new type of educational delivery system customized, user-friendly, paced for our individual learning, where the instructor, instead of having 500 or 30 students in the room, can be interacting with us individually and answering our questions and telling us what we need, where we could get the best quality teachers in the world available to every student in the world at a fraction of the cost that it is now in the language that they speak, in their own language, interacting with them. I think we're at the verge of a real revolution which may dwarf many of the technology revolutions of the past and help prepare global society for the pace of change that's happening and give the next generation the capacities, the skills, the knowledge. Uh, and get the knowledge from business, and uh, I'm, I'm saying that it's not just the technology, but we've got to get, we've got to break the monopoly on, on, on education as it's something that only happens in traditional institutions. Business, the entrepreneurship, the innovation that the, and the technological competence that the, ed, the business community has can help with tremendous pioneering initiatives to take knowledge out of the box or out of the ivory tower and make it available to people all over the world. Our organization was founded by eminent scientists from around the world, including Albert Einstein and Robert Oppenheimer, who was the father of the Manhattan Project. And when you go back to those times in the middle of World War II, when there was really a perception among the scientists that if we don't do something in the, uh, to use the, uh, the new science that's emerging of the atomic, uh, atomic energy, that the other side will do that. And therefore, scientists with the greatest interest in peace <laughs> ended up working and creating the most dangerous weapon in the world. Uh, and by the time that weapon was developed, most of those scientists felt, thank God we don't need to use it but it was used, and it was used because it was out of the hand of the scientists who had developed it. And there wasn't regulation and there wasn't policy as to how to use this new technology. And the academy was actually founded in 1960 by these people and others like them from the scientific community who felt that science can no longer be living in an ivory tower we have to take responsibility for the consequences of the knowledge that we develop and the technology that comes from it. And so governance and policy is absolutely essential if we're going to ensure technology is a double-edged sword, like most things are. You can use it for good or you can use it for something else. And without regulation, without uh, a partnership with the public to see how to use these things positively, uh, we have problems in everything. When pharmaceuticals first developed, there was no regulation for it. You could never know whether it was a legitimate drug and whether it was safely made or could be safely used. Back in 1960, we really started in the US with very close, I've studied the industry, very close uh, regulation of how things are made and even what the company tells the doctor as to what this is good for or not good for, and what's the evidence to document it. Every field where we've had great advances, at some time, technology has had to be introduced in order to ensure that it's, as far as possible, used for the public good, and not just used in every way by every, you know, for anything. Our partner, Force for Good, is just coming out with a report to show 
that the policy and regulatory aspect is a critical aspect, aspect for achieving the SDGs. So I think we, we don't look at this one thing or another. We need to get all the pieces in, in, in the right place if we're going to achieve these goals. And governance, it's the great progress we've made is that the companies themselves today, the leaders in technology today, have been the ones coming forward and saying, we have to do something to regulate this. The problem we have today is that it has to be regulated at the global level. <laughs> We've never had global regulation of this type in a very, I think we're ahead of the curve in recognizing the need. But how do we do that? How do we bring 193 countries together to agree on it? We're still having problems on nuclear energy 75 years after the, the genie came out of the box. But I think it's great that uh, today, yesterday, uh, Gary told me that, uh, or tomorrow, he's got uh, key executives from, uh, from CTA in front of the Congress testifying and looking at the regulatory uh, changes that are necessary. That's the kind of marriage, that's the kind of partnerships we need, and I think CTA has a really important role to play uh, as a model for organizations, business and technology organizations, of how we work together with civil society as we're doing and with government around the world to get a consensus on how do we use this power, great power, in the most positive way possible for the good of all humanity.